My name is Ryan Tamori. Welcome to the Pit Press Podcast. I'm joined by another co-host of mine, Mr. Well, I messed that up. He's the voice of Western New Mexico and a Lobo fan since 1970. How did I mess that up? Mr. Ed Nunez. Sir, how are you? I'm doing well, Ryan. Very well. Well, I, I would say a majority of the masculinity in this country is getting amped up because we're in the middle of August. We're my, I guess my pastime next to baseball is college football. And we're what less than two weeks away from the start of it, week zero or one. Yeah. We like, yeah. Just over a week away from the start of college football and two weeks away from the full slate. So I'm very excited about that. So we're going to get this football train going. Uh, how cliche and corny can I be? Uh, we're happy to have this gentleman on. Our next guest is a Highland High School graduate, and he played the Lobo back position for the University of New Mexico football team from 2006 to 2009. During his four years with the Lobos, he recorded 163 total tackles. 85 of those were solo, and he was also a force on special teams as a punt returner. I'm sure there's more stats here. I can't find them online, which kind of really irked me, but... And I'll ask him this question later on down the road. In 2008, he averaged 19.7 yards per punt return. Holy hell. His name is Ian Clark. Sir, welcome to the Pit Press Podcast. We are very happy to have you on. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. You know, uh, Ian, it's uh, it's great to have you on, man. You know, you and I go back, back to when you were one of my kids, man. It uh, says our Chavez Community Center many years ago. You know, you and I have remained close, had a relationship for a long time. But one of the things I want to ask you first, and, you know, Coach Judge Chavez, I talked to him a lot. He was a, a big part of our Heinen Hall of Fame induction, Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony because he coached Bobby Newcomb. He coached Jared Baxter, who are two of our inductees, and he coached you. He always speaks very highly of you. You played for Coach Chavez at Heinen High. How did playing at Heinen and for Coach Chavez prepare you for playing football at UNM? Uh, I think that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you're starting off there. I, you know, I think every athlete has an opportunity to take something away from each one of the coaches, whether it be good, whether it be bad. I've been fortunate enough to have um, several men in my life, you know, in, in the coaching uh, realm that have really helped shape me and uh, mold me into not only a better athlete, but a better man. And Coach Chavez is definitely one of those guys. Um, you know, there's, there's not there's not enough I can say about about Coach Chavez. He, you know, he believed in me. He's the one that you know um, believed in me and my abilities at the quarterback position and helped me to open up my eyes and uh, become a running quarterback. When I thought a quarterback was supposed to sit back in the pocket and pass, I just thought Michael Vick was the only person allowed to do that. You know, so uh, but Coach Chavez knew how to um, knew how to coach a person like me. And you know, you're probably very well aware. Uh, what type of kid I used to be. So. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I got to tell you a quick story, and I'll get on to the, the questions. But he told me, he told me a story about you. He told me, he told you, brought you to the sideline and said, run the ball. In, so, in stronger terms than that, that I won't say. And <laughs> so uh, you say that is pretty time because he just told me the story about you probably about two months ago. So uh, great answer there. You know, uh, Ian, there's been some some peak moments with UNM football. Dennis Franchoni had some good years. 
Uh, Jolie Dunn, a few. Joe Morrison, a 10 and one season, gone. I, I would argue, and so would Ryan. Ryan's a big Lobo fan from this era. You played football at UNM at arguably the peak of the program. What are your memories of that time? Well, I remember my very first day, I got a phone call from Coach Reffitt uh, telling me he wanted me to go down there. And, they, you know, when I got recruited, they weren't sure where they were going to place me. I was either going to be – they recruited me as an athlete. At the time, I was a quarterback in high school. Um, and from what I was told by Brian Clampett, who's one of the other quarterbacks, was that, you know, had they not um, been able to bring on – I don't know how true this is, but had they not been able to bring on Donovan Portery, that they were going to consider me for a quarterback. So – uh, once they finally signed the paperwork with Donovan, they knew they were going to place me on defense and put me at cornerback. I didn't want to argue. I was like, I just want an opportunity to play. So I go down to the film room, and uh, very first day I go up into the film room, and Coach Reff is showing me some film, and I'm like, what did I get myself into? Uh, everybody was just – the guy was clearly down. Everybody's jumping on the pile, and this is practice film. You know, it was so fast. Uh, but playing in that – and that era of Lobo football was unlike any other. And, and you really don't know how to describe it unless you played in it. Coach Long is a special individual, a special type of coach. Uh, he was hard-nosed, no-nonsense, old-school coach. Like, we played the man's game of football. There was no, you know, when you look at the uniforms back in those days, nobody was individualized. You know, very, you know, be surprised if you got saw somebody like Marcus Smith getting away with wearing extra wristbands. You know, that was about the extent. At one point, he considered removing our names from the back of our jerseys because he wanted us to play as one. We weren't allowed to wear black socks. We weren't aware to, we weren't allowed to spat our cleats unless you had an injury. And so it was just old school. It was all about the game of football, and that's the best way I can describe it. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. By the way. Ed, I, I was I I was supposed to remain objective during those locks of years, but uh, yeah, I did grow up a big Lobo football fan. We talk about this all the time. How we, I, I mean, my friends in high school, the early, probably Ian, you were the same age. Like I graduated high school in 05. Yeah. And we used to live and die by those early 2000 teams, man. It's like it made it didn't like our our NFL teams. Our our week was made by if the UNM football team won or lost. It was crazy. Uh, when you were here at UNM. New, now head football coach Danny Gonzalez was an assistant coach under Rocky Long. Before we started talking, you were like, man, I love Coach G. What kind of influence did he have on you? Uh, so to go back to my earlier statement, I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, several male role models in my life uh, in the football world. Uh, one of them being Coach David Lee, whose son, his oldest son, is now the head coach at Academy High School. Um and then Coach Chavez, and then Coach G. I, you know, definitely have a lot of respect for Coach Long, but Coach G really took me under his wing. He made me feel comfortable. He made me. He knew how to, you know, I was, I was a wild child back in the day for sure. And Coach G knew how to handle and manage my emotions. He was. I, I always say he's like a second father to me. Um, you know, I, I not. I don't have enough kind words for Coach G. I like that answer. Rocky Long had a great defense while you played at UNM. I mean, it was, you know, he's the father of what, the 335. But tell yeah. us a little bit about the challenges it was playing in that scheme. So confusing, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be put in the Lobo back position because the defense is designed to funnel everything, whether it be a run uh, or whatever the case may be. It's all designed to be funneled to uh, the Lobo safety, right? And so you got a lot of selfless guys on the team that understand that they're taking up blocks to, to free up, a, uh, to free up the running back to run straight into my arms. And so, but damn, that was confusing, man. And if you weren't a student of the game, there was no way you were able to hang. Like, you, you know, I, you had to study your playbook. And I think the most impressed I ever was by somebody on the team was Zach Arnett. We, I forget what game we were playing, but we're standing out there in the middle of the field. He knows because of the down in the distance and the tendencies, he studied the plays that well. He could call out exactly what Coach Long was going to signal in. And so, but it was amazing, man. I mean, like, like I said, it was all about smash mouth football. It didn't matter if we were the fastest team, the other team was going to lead filling it. And they were going to, our presence was going to be felt. So, you know, I often say I wish I had an opportunity to play the offense, but I, I'm so thankful to have played uh, defense under Coach Long. 
and uh, <clears throat> played it well. You know, uh, Ian, you mentioned Coach Gonzalez and what a fan you are of him and what a big influence he was uh, in your life, not only as a player, but but as a man. We've been waiting for a while, you know, to see how the Lobo football program, uh, you know, it's, it uh, floundered uh, under Coach Loxley, didn't do well. Uh, Coach Davey had a you know, few winning seasons, you know, made nine and four season, made a bowl game. Uh, do, you're, you know, you're a big fan of Coach Gonzalez. Do you think he can bring the Lobo program to what it was under Coach Long? You're saying under Coach Long? I get, what it was, you know, what it was under Coach Long. Can, can Coach Gonzalez bring it back to that level? I have full faith in Coach Coach G for sure. Uh, he knows the program. He, I mean, he's a student of the game. He was he was a player under Coach Long. He knows what it takes to be. He was around for those good years. You know, he never left Coach Long's side, and now he's able to, has the opportunity to venture off on his own and bring in some new insight, uh, some fresh blood. You know, so I definitely believe that Coach G has what it takes to to shape and mold these guys. I was telling Ryan earlier. I was listening to the podcast with Coach G and. Uh, him talking about the team bonding things that he was doing with some of his team. That's the kind of guy that Coach G is. He knows he has special techniques uh, and ways to, to connect with these kids to help them understand the teamwork and unity. Uh, and he makes you believe the things that he's saying. You watch the little clips that you know on, on Instagram Reels and you hear he's not putting on a show. That's Coach G. And so I, you know, I have full faith in Coach G that he'll be able to turn this program around. And I think you and I talked about this on the phone, Ed. I think the biggest component for sure is going to be that offense. You know, we're always pretty solid on defense for the most part, but I'm, I'm really interested to see. I was out there uh, Saturday with Frankie Baca and Eric Cook watching those guys practice with open practice. And quarterbacks looking nice. Receivers are looking good. Defense is looking good. So I'm really excited to see what we can bring to the table this year. You know, uh, Ian, you mentioned the uh, the confusion of the uh, three three five. Well, everything flows to the Lobo back. Uh, it's it confused a lot of offenses. Coach Long, uh, Ned James calls uh, Coach Long the Pac twelve killer. Man, that's that's how <laughs> high regard he has for Coach Long. You know, so after coming back to UNM and being defensive coordinator for three years, Coach Long, you know, it's kind of a surprising move left to become the defensive coordinator at Syracuse. How big of a loss is that to the Lobo football program and their defense? You mentioned that. You know, the defense is usually pretty good, but when you lose a, a, a defensive coordinator like Rocky Long, how big a loss is that? Yeah, you know, Ed, I, it's – when I first heard Coach Long and Coach G were coming back as a tandem, uh, I was through the roof. But I think, yeah, it's devastating for sure. I mean, this is, this is Coach Long's specialty. This is what he does. What other head coach is really out there really focused on the defense, you know? Um, and I'm saying it, I'm always thinking of Coach Long as a head coach, right? But I think this is something that's a necessity uh, that needs to happen uh, for Coach G to make his own way. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of pressure on Coach G. And then, but, you know, you got Coach Rutherford who's been with the program for how long, you know? Uh, perfectly capable. And if anybody's as hard nosed and hardcore as, as Coach Long, Troy Rapid is for sure. Every time I hear the name Frankie Baca, I think of my buddy Sean Mallory, my our senior year of high school. Yeah. LaCueva kicked the crap out of St. Pius. And I think on a kick return, somebody hit Frankie Baca out of bounds and and Sean, my buddy Sean, I wasn't on the team, but I saw from the stands he just stood over Frankie Baca and he was like, Oh, Frankie Baca. I don't know why. I, I don't know how that story sounded, but I always think of that. It's no disrespect to Frankie. It's just exactly. every time I hear that, every time I hear his name, I think of my buddy, Sean Mallory standing over him and yelling his name into his face when we were seniors in high school, but go figure. Anyway, yeah. I think I everybody, just, had, everybody had a chip on the shoulder against LeClay, but you know, funny thing is Sean Mallory was at our house for the party. So. Oh yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure he was. Yeah. We all were. I, I, I'm not going to go there. We all had stories. Those pious guys were, you know, anyway. Um, back to UNM. Uh, you were on that 2007 team that, that went 9-4. and four. You had a victory in the New Mexico Bowl over Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick and the Nevada Wolfpack, and I forgot that coach's name when I wrote this question. Um, but you were a part of that team that was like the first bowl win in 40 years. What it did? What did it be? What was it like to be on that? If I could talk today, what was it like to be on that team? And what was it like to be a part of that that year? And Ed says it all the time. We talk about Steve Alford years, and I'm just making the reference here. 
like 30 and five teams, 30 and 30 and a 30 and five record don't grow on trees. A nine and four record doesn't grow on trees. What was that like? Well, I'll be honest with you. I feel that there were three games that season that we shouldn't have lost that we lost. Um, UTEP was our, was our season opener. And I think, you know, there's a lot of young starters. I was so nervous. Um, just going out there. I mean, we made some stupid plays and, you know, missed some field goals that we should have made. And I think that's a game we should have won. Uh, we made some mistakes down in Utah and the BYU, the controversial call. If you want to ever look into that, there was a block in the back that, you know, called back one of our touchdowns that cost us the game. Uh, Coach Long took some flack for speaking out on it uh, publicly, but then we downright, downright got, got our asses handed to us against TCU. Um, but to answer your question, it, it was awesome, man. I mean, it was a great feeling to be part of history at UNM, you know, in the place of the city that I grew up in. Um, you know, it's kind of it's frustrating to see, you know, what people think of the program when you know what, what, the, what the potential of the program is and what it was and what it's truly about. Um, and so um, that's, that's why I have full faith in Coach G. But, you know, to go back to your question, it was an unreal feeling. You, I mentioned it, introducing you as our guest. You were, a, I remember that now. You were a dynamic punt returner, and then you averaged just under the 20 yards per punt return in 2008. That is not an easy thing to do. Does that come natural to you, naturally to you? Did you, I don't know, I'm thinking of Devin Hester right away, or maybe Deion Sanders. Did you like channel your inner Deion or inner Devin Hester? But how was, how did you do that? What was so special about trying to return a kick? Uh, you know, I think it was just, I, I was always an offensive guy, you know, I, from my Yaffle days to high school, um, I was always an offensive guy. And so running the ball came natural. I was never really a passing quarterback. I was more of a running quarterback. Um, I used to, and you know, Highlands historically always has low numbers. So we never came off the field. I played quarterback. I was a punt returner. I was on kickoff. I was on kick return. I was on punt return. So, uh, it was, pretty natural for the most part. I was never a stats guy, to be honest with you. I never really even watched sports. I just loved to play. I thought watching sports was so boring for me. It was like, I, okay, I, you know, I would get all this, it would give me like all this adrenaline rush and I would have to go outside and, and go do something. Um, and so I didn't know I was like leading the nation in pump returns until I think Coach Todd had told me something about, you know, hey, you know, you're leading the nation. And then from then on, I, I wish I wouldn't have known because I would have just been out, you know, just kept returning punts like normal. But, I, you know, then it was started sitting in the back of my mind. And I think we were playing Texas, who we were playing TCU. And I think Clint McPeak came up to me, and I don't know how many tackles I had that game. He's like, oh, dude, he's like, bro, he's like, you know how many tackles you have? And I was like, no. He's like, dude, you have like this many tackles. I was like, is that a lot? You know, I was never, I just, I just went out there. I just loved playing football, honestly. Who are the five best players you've played with or against in your life? Uh, played with or against? Uh, I would say uh, Gabe Fulbright. Uh, I would say, rest in peace, uh, DeAndre Wright and Glover Quinn. I, I do not think, I can't believe DeAndre didn't you know, go as far as Glover Quinn did because watching him and Glover Quinn cover receivers in practice was amazing. It was unreal. It was like they were running routes backwards. Uh, Zach Arnett, his football IQ was through the roof. Um, I'm trying to think. Man, you put me on the spot with this one. I think that was a better question than my punt return question. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh. – I don't know who's, who's got a spot in that, that fifth spot. I mean, you got so many players, man. It's a, you got Dontrell Moore, you got Cole McCain, you got uh, Hank Basket, um, so many of these guys. But um, yeah, it, that's a hard one. I, I can't say. So, it's a good list. I'll, I'll defer back to Ed because I like yeah. the next question better. You know, it's a, you know, you brought up bringing up Zach Arnett. You, you know, you play with a lot of talent. Ryan has a question for you later regarding that but you played with uh, Zach Arnett who's now the head football coach at Mississippi State uh you know coach Mike Leach passed away and Zach Arnett 
in a good position, but a heck of a good, you know, it's not going to give that job to anyone. Did you see him as a head coach at a major college so soon in his coaching career? Yeah, honestly, it didn't surprise me, Ed. I, uh, I was surprised more so that he went into uh, coaching rather than bodybuilding, man. I mean, Zach was all about bodybuilding. And if you know Zach, you know, I consider Zach a good friend, um, you know, via Frankie and those guys, you know, we, you know, we all got pretty close for the most part, but um, Zach was a very plain and simple guy. I mean, we went into his dorm room. We didn't have a poster on the wall. He had a couple shirts in the closet and all he did was think about football and lifting weights. Um, but yeah, I mean, with his football IQ, like I said, Ed, that, that day on the field, I'll never forget it. I wish I knew who it was that we were playing. I think it was, Based off of, you know, so we would go through these uh, these film sessions before the game, right? And we would break down. We would go over uh, down in distance. So where's the ball at? Tendencies of personnel. So Zach would look at the personnel. He would know the down in distance. He would know where we at, where we were at on the field, which hashtag, which hash mark we were on. And based off of that, he could tell you exactly what Coach Long was going to play. And I think he said, full Lobo, go switch. And then sure as shit, you know, Coach Long signals in, full Lobo, go switch. I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? You know, so no, it doesn't surprise me. Man. He's, a, he's a genius. Like, he's a football genius. So, I look, they got the right guy over there. That's a, that is amazing. That's from a long time ago. So you saw that at an early age. You know, we talked about Rocky Long's defensive st- strategy, which you mentioned confused a lot of people. Now he's the master of the three-three-five. We know that. You mentioned all the flow and the lobo back and everybody moving in, in, in sync, but kind of controlled chaos, if you will. The blitzing from different angles. That defense paralyzed a lot of people. Are there wrinkles in Coach uh, Gonzalez's D that you like more or less? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned Coach Gonzalez. It's his time to shine. Uh, in, but nobody knows that defense like Coach Long. But do you, do you see any wrinkles in Coach uh, Gonzalez's defense that you like more or less? Or he's doing the same thing. That's a little bit different. Have you noticed? Not that I can tell. You know, it's uh... – I try to look at the signals at the games and stuff like that and see what he's calling. And um, there's some new signals and things like that, but that, you know, to the naked eye, I, I was never really like that, that high in football IQ that I could notice the difference for the most part. But, you know, I, like I said, I've got confidence that he's, he's going to do just fine. You know, I, and I think, you know, coach Long's a, he's an old school cat, man, might be stuck in his ways. And, and I think coach G will bring some new things. The, the game is forever evolving. The game always evolves. You know, it's never going to stay the same. And so I think it has to be, there has to be some mixing up in order for us to get to where we want to be. You played with Eric Cook, guys you've mentioned before and that I've mentioned, we've all mentioned here in this, in this episode, you've played with guys like Eric Cook, DeAndre Wright, Glover Quinn, Donovan Portery. Talk about that kind of talent on those Lobo rosters. You know, at the time when you're playing it, you're just thinking of your brothers, you know. Um, and you look across the the way the way that that defense was set up, I mean, it was an all-out battle on, you know, every day of practice, you know. And so it's like we did everything that we could to put the offense in the place any time we got an opportunity to go up against them and go live. They caught a pass on us. They were going to let us know they caught a pass on us. You know, so, I mean, at the time, but looking back at it, it's just like, wow, these guys are really doing some amazing things. You know, I remember Donovan and Puerto Rico first coming out, and it's like, oh, man, we've never played in the state of New Mexico. We've never played against a kid like this. You know, somebody that can run. He's accurate with the ball. Um, so, DeAndre Wright, uh, him and Glover Quinn, those guys running routes backwards in their sleep, you know. Um, Eric Cook, uh, trying to blitz through his gap was never fun. I uh, used to try to just run through them, and it never seemed to work, no matter how strong I got. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just – but at the end of the day, they were, all, they were all just brothers, and that's that's the thing that I miss the most. I'll never forget my first week of practice. I was so scared. And uh, the reason why I mentioned Gabriel Fulbright and Mike Padrell, those two took me under the wing and made me feel like, you know, part of the team within the first week. You know, they, they wanted me to come stand by them, and they, went, they encouraged me and told me that, you know, I was here for a reason. Uh, so it was just a real tight knit community and, and brotherhood, and, and you saw that fade my senior year, Loxley's first year. And not too often a tangent about you know Coach Loxley. I just think you know it was just wasn't the place for him. I think he's a great guy, you know, on a personal level. 
Um, but, you know, and then after that, it just, it, it fizzles away. And, it, and I see, you know, every time I go down there and DeAndre is always telling us, you guys need to come back more. Like, we want you guys to come back. We're slowly trickling back, man. It's, it's been a long time since we felt welcome. You know, so we're just trying to trying to get that feeling back. I'm gonna. Ed's gonna ask you that question in a second because I, I, I'm interested about that because I'm gonna be selfish here. I covered the team then, and it was like I didn't play for the program, but to see what it went from like a complete nosedive, and it was, I mean, it was upsetting. I'm gonna shut up. What, <laughs> what's your, what's your opinion? And I didn't play on the team, and I get pissed off. What's your opinion on the Lobo position on the defense? I should have asked those two questions reverse, but what's your opinion of the Lobo position on the defense? It's the best position there is, man. I mean, if you want action, if you are not afraid to get hit or get deliver a hit, that's where you want to be. If you want the plays, if you want to be the playmaker on the field, that's the position that you want to be. You know, uh, Ian, I interviewed you many years ago. This is our third time really interviewing. I interviewed you on the sports desk on ProView Networks about four years ago, but in your senior season against Texas A&M, you blew out a shoulder. And I remember talking to you about this. Uh, you know, what was your decision process in not coming back to try to play football one more season at UNM or try to make a go at the, in, in the professional ranks, which was talked about at that time. You talked about, you know, maybe going to the, the combine, maybe, maybe making a, a, a go at it or, or, or try to as a free agent or maybe even get drafted. But what was your thought process at that time when you suffered that injury? Oh, man, how real do you want me to get, Ed? <laughs> you know, Ian, we've talked about it, man. You know what? Yeah. That's, Ian, you know what? Whatever you want to say, man, that's that's on you. No, I, I'm very open about my story, man. I uh, Because you never know who's going through a similar situation. You don't know what other people have been through. You don't know what is um, what is possible, you know? So... I'll put it to you like this. My whole life, I, I remember my eighth grade year going into Highland High School. I, you know, you have to go meet. And, you know, from a young, young age, I was always pretty, like, for the most part, modest. I, I always knew how good I was, but I wasn't going to come out and say it. And, um, oh, did I lose you guys? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, no, we can hear you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we're okay. good there. Um, I always knew that, you know, I'm, when I get older, I'm going to play football. And they always tell you, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And we sat down with the guidance counselor from Highland High School. I don't even remember what the lady's name was. She said, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, when you get older, I said, I'm going to be a professional football player with a straight look. And she laughed. And I always remember that day. And so from then on, my motivation was to play football. So going all the way through college, you know, it was like I have an opportunity um, to continue playing and fulfill my dream of being in the NFL. And so uh, – First game of the season rolls around, playing against Texas a and Matter of fact, uh, a couple months before that, first day of summer camp, I decided, you know, I was already playing with the brace on my right arm, uh, and I already had one on my left arm from my sophomore year, so I said, I'm going to take the brace off my left arm this year, and I'll just play with the right one. Um, first day in practice, I go up to, you know, we're doing thud. We're not even full contact. My shoulder slips out of socket. So I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, I'll just wear the brace for the rest of the year. Um, play through it, and then I get the surgery at the end of the season. Um, first game of the year, I blow my shoulder out, and I was devastated. And I think, I look, I take all responsibility for all of my actions and uh, what I did with my life from that point up until now. Um, I was super depressed, but, you know, at the same time, the reason why I brought that up is because I, you know, when I decided to make the decision, I was gonna, I stuck around for three more games. I said, well, my bread and butter is probably going to be punt returning anyway, so I'm going to see if we can you know, return some punts. And we couldn't get a team to punt. So I said, well, I'm sitting here wasting my time when I can get my surgery and then I can get ready for pro day. So I got my surgery. I didn't get a single phone call from any of the coaches. Um, I got severely depressed. Started abusing my pain medicine. Uh, stayed at home. Uh, didn't want to do anything. And um, all I did was take pills and it spiraled out of control for quite some time. And um, before it got too bad, I got a phone call. This was like after school had ended. I didn't finish my degree um, at the time. Um, I was working at a gym, and I got a phone call from Dave Binder, who's, uh, who's retired. He was our um, uh, trainer then. He said, hey, uh, a couple of teams are asking about you. They want to know if you're going to come down for pro day. And I thought about it for a second, and I just said, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to go. And 
probably one of the worst and best decisions of my life. Uh, I say worst because I always still have that lingering thought of what if. Um, and the best because I was expecting my little girl. And had I gone on that journey, and you know the life of a free agent is you bounce around from team to team for many years. And I don't think I would have a strong relationship with my daughter as I do today. Um, so, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit, you know, I got to turn my life around, finished my degree, got a great career, um, getting remarried here in a, about a week. So, you know, things are looking up, but it's, I, I'm very open about my story because I think it's important that, you know, people know that these things happen and it doesn't matter, you know, race, age, you know, social status, these things happen. So. Well, you have certainly battled your way back from that end, and someone that knows you and uh, and loves you, I'm proud of you, man. You, you really, uh, it's a heck of a story, and uh, we appreciate your candidness on that on that answer. You know, uh, Ian, do you have any personal interest in this year's team? Do you uh, care to make any uh, predictions on where you think this team may end up? I'm a very super superstitious guy, as most most athletes are, so I will not make a prediction, but I will be at it. Uh, every game possible, every home game, that's for sure. Um, and I'm very optimistic that we'll get above five, we'll have another 500 team for sure. And I, you know, I think it's been, been rebuilding. We've been rebuilding for quite some time. Now is the time for us to start turning the corner. Uh, and I think with the squad we have and with all the changes in the NIL, um, I think it finally, the dust has settled and allow us, allowed us to start making some waves in this conference. You did play at Kyle Field, and obviously, I think they've gone on. You know, if especially if you watch Johnny football, um, they've gone over some renovations. Um, but what is it like to play in? Like, what is it? What's that experience like? What is what is it like to play in that hostile environment? Um, it was pretty awesome. I mean, I would say more memorable than that was probably I would say the University of Arizona. I would say more memorable than that was playing at BYU. I mean, that, I mean, those, you know, getting off the bus at BYU and they're, oh, thank you for coming. Thank you for this. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> you know, it's this, <laughs> don't, don't trust them, you know, and then they, you know, thank you for coming. And, you know, how a great game when you're leaving after they just, you know, finished uh, winning. We won that game. I would just say that. But, um, yeah, I, I think more memorable. And, and it was with, what I call my – those guys are always going to be my teammates from start to finish. For the five years that I was there, every single one of those guys I consider my brothers. The unity was in within that four years, though. So I will say that. There, there, was a, there was a major difference within that four years, and I honestly think a lot of it I attribute to Coach Mark Paulson, our strength and conditioning coach, which I don't think he gets enough praise and recognition for all of those years that UNM – uh, was the type of program that we were. You know, Mark Tolson had it down to a science. You know, his, uh, his counterpart, Joaquin Chavez, I mean, those guys were amazing. And they, they helped mold us, and they, they turned us into men, for sure. Yeah, I think, Ed, that's a name, and I know Eric's on listening on this, but yeah, that's a name that I haven't heard in a while, and I remember that was a big, <laughs> that was a big deal. Um, you know, man, I, I just wanted to comment uh, before we let you get out of here. Um, you're talking, you're looking at m me. I was a fall down drunk, um, at one point in my life. And I didn't, I, I think I remember hearing that. So, you know, for me to you, I don't preach like the whole sobriety thing. And I put that up in air quotes. Um, I, I have lived and made the bed that I had, uh, when I was a big boozer. Um, and I'm about, and by the way, congratulations on getting married. Um, I am, uh, what is it? Yeah, less than less than two weeks away from not having a sip of alcohol in two years. So, um, awesome, from, so from somebody, yeah, and I, I'm not like preachy about it. So forgive me. I, I I'm like, you know, hey, you want to go drink? Go drink. You want to, you know, you want to do whatever. People, are, I think, are addicted to Call of Duty. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, but I, I just I, I from one guy who's cleaned up his act to another. I congratulate you, man. And I just wanted to say that because um, I used to sit at a bar all day, every day. Um, he is a former Lobo back for the University of New Mexico. Uh, his name is Ian Clark. Man, we can't thank you enough for joining us here on the Pit Press Podcast. Oh, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. 